Yes. Everybody have a seat. We're going to go ahead and get started here in a moment. The committee will come to order. I thank everybody for joining us today. Without objection, the chair will declare a recess at any time. Um, for today's open panel is being broadcast. It is being broadcast live on committee's YouTube channel. We conduct it entirely on an unclassified basis. All participants are reminded to refrain from discussing classified or other information protected from public disclosure. When we began this Congress, um, Jim Himes, my ranking member, and, and I committed to each other that we were going to run this committee in a bipartisan basis. Uh, I can report uh, that we have, uh, we have accomplished this, and I think all of our members have, uh, have committed themselves to that, and this committee has functioned on a bipartisan basis. Um, in launching the committee, um, we asked former members to come uh, before us and to give us their perspective on things that we needed to do, including uh, the uh, endorsement of our working in a bipartisan basis, their substantive uh, thoughts and backgrounds from their prior work of having been on the House Intelligence Committee. Um, and we are going doing the same this year. We've asked four uh, former House Intelligence Committee members to come before us. We recently had the intelligence community before us for our what is known as the Worldwide Threats Hearing, and that was a public hearing. So we're asking for your commentary now and your thoughts as to uh, ways in which we can ensure that our agenda and our strategy over the next year serves our national interest. Uh, so I get to introduce uh, not only our former colleagues, but our, our friends. I think everyone on this committee has such a high regard for the people who are here today. Uh, former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, who during her time in Congress remained steadfast in her commitment to U.S. national security. Ms. Harmon served as the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee in the 107th and the 108th Congresses. She also chaired the House Homeland Security Subcommittee on Intelligence and served as the president and CEO of the Wilson Center following her time in office. Former Congresswoman Ileana Ross Layton, who made history as the first Hispanic Republican woman and the first Cuban American elected to Congress. Ms. Ross Layton was a leader in advocacy for the U.S. Israel relationship during her time in the House of Representatives and was an incredible member of the Intelligence Committee. A former Congressman Peter King, uh, who was known for his dedication to U.S. counterterrorism efforts. Homeland Security Committee in the 109th and 112th Congress, and he is a well known commentator on national security and world affairs to this day. Former Congressman Jim Cooper, who has spent time in Congress over four separate decades. He previously served as the chair of the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces on the Committee on Armed Services and was instrumental in the creation of the United States Space Force. Um, Jim, uh, since you have at times left and come back and left and come back, we look forward to you coming back. <laughs> um, so our committee is uh, charged with uh, holding the intelligence community accountable as well as supporting the intelligence community efforts to ensure um, that we are contributing to our national security. We look forward to your comments today uh, on um, our oversight functions and on our functions of contributing to national security. Uh, we're meeting, of course, in the context of the conflicts in both Israel and in, um, in, in Ukraine. Um, I, I'm very concerned of the news today that we may be uh, backsliding in our commitment to provide a vote on the House floor uh, for Ukraine funding. Uh, a, a bill to fund Ukraine would pass on the House floor overwhelmingly. Uh, we are at a critical juncture uh, publicly. Everyone has, has seen the reports that Russia is, as a result of the delay that has occurred in, in the United States, uh, sending additional funding <clears throat> to Ukraine is increasing its pressure upon Ukraine and upon the front line. And the, um, the, the people of Kharkiv are uh, under constant assault at this point and uh, deserve uh, our assistance and uh, our military support. Uh, I'm certain that this will also be uh, a subject matter of our discussion today. Uh, with that, I recognize my ranking member, Mr. Hobbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, as the chairman alluded to, uh, this may be the pivotal day. This may be the pivotal day for this country in terms of whether we are defining the next generation as doing what the last several generations did, which is to make some sacrifices for democracy. Uh, and as we have learned, uh, 
democracy is not a given. It is something that is defended and fought for. And today is the Churchill versus Chamberlain moment. The speaker appeared to have been on a path to find a way to provide aid to Ukraine, to provide aid to Israel, to provide humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Three things which, by the way, would have substantial majority votes in this House, but apparently has gotten cold feet. That's a massive failure of our democracy because each of those things would receive, in my estimation, at least 300 votes in the House of Representatives, probably many more. But it's also a massive threat to democracies everywhere. The critics of aid to Ukraine focus hard, and I think erroneously, on Ukraine. And they ask questions that we never asked of our British allies or our French allies when they were under threat in the 1930s and 1940s, like precisely what is the end game? How many inspector generals can we send? Those are questions that we've never asked. They're good questions, but we've never held up aid as we've asked those questions. But what really worries me is not so much Ukraine, but the fact that President Xi of China, Supreme Leader Khamenei of Iran, Kim Jong-un of North Korea, the leader of Hezbollah, is now and today seeing that with precisely zero casualties on the part of our armed services and an amount of money that is a rounding error on our federal budget, we have lost our will. We have lost our will to stand up for what is right and for what is democratic. Zero casualties, a rounding error on our budget. That is a lesson that President Xi and the cast of horribles around the world who are engaged in an explicit assault on democracy, that is what they will learn today if this body fails to do what it must do. So we have before us here decades, if not generations, of national security leadership. And I hope, though, we also want to hear from you on the narrow questions of oversight and HIPSI that you'll take some time to talk about the consequences to this country if the speaker loses his nerve and we leave this week without having done what this country needs to do and what it has always done. More narrowly, we hope you'll shed some light on how you, with the benefit of some distance and perspective, can help us be better overseers of the critical work of the intelligence community. Um, we are infinitely distractible by the issues of the day, and so having your guidance and your wisdom will really be important. And uh, with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you. Uh, our order of um, opening statements will be Ms. Harmon, Ms. Ross Layton, and Mr. King, and Mr. Cooper. Uh, with that, I recognize Ms. Harmon for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm reeling over here after these opening statements, thinking about what I might say that would be consequential. I love this committee. I spent eight years on this committee, eight bipartisan years working with everyone else who served on this committee at the time uh, during 9-11. And we found a way then, after two massive intelligence failures, to pass uh, uh, IRTPA, the, uh, I never can remember what it stands for, but the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, which uh, reorganized our intelligence community for the first time since 1947 and has produced much better intelligence estimates and more and better leadership and uh, done things that I think really matter in terms of uh, uh, predicting what would happen in Ukraine, helping just days ago uh, predict and uh, with help from others uh, identify where the uh, attacks on Israel would, were coming from, et cetera. So um, this committee really took a, a major role in, in making our intelligence better. Having said that, uh, I am worried sick. Uh, I'm worried sick about two things. One is Section 702 and whether or not after uh, heroic action the other day, the speaker broke the tie on a, on a, on a, uh, a really uh, um, cata catastrophic amendment. Uh, and uh, I thought we were safe for the next two years. Um, I'm worried we might backslide there. And on uh, this aid package, I, I, I am uh, beyond worried. Um, I was in Ukraine two weeks ago. I just mentioned that to some of you. I chair something called the, the, the Commission on National Defense Strategy, which is critiquing or assessing our 2022 National Defense Strategy, which is the strategy doctrine for the, for the Pentagon. 
And three of us were there to see uh, the defense industrial base in Ukraine and learn what was going on. And shorthand, uh, there is a defense industrial base in Ukraine, which is building short range and longer range drones and tanks. And they're going right to the uh, front. Problem is, they work. However, uh, the signals from the uh, drones are being blocked by the Russians, and uh, our aid would provide the anti-jamming equipment they need, and there's no air cover for the tanks because of what we're doing. So what is happening there is they're losing people every hour. Uh, um, Zelensky had a, an interview with David Ignatius of the Post and others saying that they have to cut the line. Cut the line means they can't defend all their territory anymore against Russians. And we literally were told that if there are just a few Russians coming at them, they can't do anything because they don't have enough ammo. Uh, they have to wait till there are 100 Russians or some more major attack. So this dithering is killing people. Not us, as you pointed out, but it's killing our friends and, and, and allies and, and the buffer against Russia and NATO. And once NATO is attacked, and that's every intention, so far as I know, of Vladimir Putin, especially if he wins easily at this point, uh, then we're at war. So it is uh, dumb and lame, and I, uh, let me close with this, just a message to the speaker whom I don't know and ha did not serve with. Uh, doing the right thing is much more important than trying to survive. If you do the right thing, you have a great chance of surviving. If you don't do the right thing, I think you have a weakened chance of surviving. And why does anyone serve here? One serves here to add value. And this is crunch time for America, and it's crunch time for the House of Representatives. And the good news is that the people sitting on the dais up here all understand that and all want to do the right thing and are prepared to be brave. So uh, I, I just hope, I, I hope, I hope that there, a way will be found. Maybe he'll relent and put the Senate bill on the floor. That's the right answer. Or maybe a discharge petition or some other procedural way will be found around his cowardice. Thank you. Mr. Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and, and the members of this committee. I'm honored to give uh, this committee my very limited perspectives. To begin, I'd, I'd like to congratulate and commend the committee on its return to bipartisanship, a condition without which this committee cannot function effectively. But you already know this, having uh, uh, received the chairman and the ranking member the Publius Award for your leadership and for your bipartisanship from the Center for the Study of Congress and the Presidency. Felicidades, congratulations. On the issues, I will omit a detailed argument that I have in support of my strong belief that both Ukraine and Taiwan must be, must be strongly supported against Russia and China, both for their own survival and for the maintenance of confidence in the U.S. among our allies. As Mr. Himes called it in his opening statement, we have lost our will, and people have noticed. Likewise, I will not discuss in detail the need for awareness of the threats which both Russia and China pose to us here in the U.S., nor will I discuss the threat of Iran, whose leaders pervert the doctrine of jihad from an internal struggle to live the right path to a deadly mandate to destroy non-believers, especially the little Satan, Israel, and the great Satan, the United States. Instead, let me address three more directly related intel or security matters. First, we all must reread the 9-11 Commission report, particularly regarding the border. As the Commission described it in the year 2001, our porous borders and the weak enforcement of immigration laws. From a national security perspective, it was an overwhelming problem. These are their words, that a large population lives outside of the legal framework. The commission urged the U.S. to design a comprehensive screening system enabling frontline border officials to establish that people are who they say they are. The commission asserted that an effective entry exit system is an essential investment in our national security. It is elemental to border security to know who is coming into this country. Their words. A chilling finding of the commission fits our state of abject neglect today. 
protecting borders, they say, was not a national security issue before 9-11. One look at the southwest border today tells us that protecting borders is still not a national security issue. We've gone backwards. The 9-11 Commission warns us that we are neglecting our duty to the American people. We have a chaotic and often non-existent border screening, and this negligence continues today. In the fiscal year 2023, 172 known or suspected terrorists were encountered between ports of entry. Also, an Al-Shabaab member was improperly released into the U.S. and lived here for a year before apprehension. One of many examples. So my first concern for the committee is control of the borders. Second, I join the chorus of folks in congratulating the committee and the House for passing a version of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. FISA is one of the most important tools in our national security arsenal. And as useful as the FISA system is, I believe that its continued existence and viability depends on public confidence in its application. Past abuses, sometimes for political purposes, create cynicism. It weakens confidence in FISA, in the rule of law more generally. Furthermore, the failure to punish past abusers, such as misrepresentation to the FISA court, leaks for political gain, et cetera, reinforces such cynicism. FISA is a victim of the declining confidence of the American people in the rule of law in our country, in the Department of Justice, and in the FBI. If citizens are to trust the fair use of FISA, these institutions must earn back the respect they have lost. A thorough review by this committee of past abuses of FISA would be useful in this regard. The committee should consider what strengthened sanctions may be added to FISA to fight abuse and punish abusers. The public deserves to know whether, to what extent the reports of government misrepresentation to the FISA reports to the FISA courts were true, and what sanctions were levied against those who misrepresented. Were there no criminal prosecutions? And if so, why not? So my second recommendation is a review of FISA abuses. Third and final, I commend the study of the various methods by which foreign adversaries adversaries, especially China, are planning to use artificial intelligence, AI, to create an artificial reality, AR, in the U.S. Your committee has done a phenomenal job in this field. This is particularly a particular danger among young people uh, who use these tech uh, platforms. And they think they're sophisticated, but they're not likely to recognize the complex forms of manipulation through artificially created impressions and images. The TikTok situation is just one example of the threat. So again, I trust that difficult, intense debate and good faith differences of opinion need not impair your fine, outstanding bipartisanship. Our national security demands no less, and I am confident in your success in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh Mr. Ranking Member, first of all, thank you for having me here today. It's a great opportunity. I appreciate being invited back. Uh, I had, to me, wonderful years on this committee, and this committee serves such a great purpose. But, you know, often we talk about how great the old days were and how bad it is today. This committee is right now functioning better than it did in the, certainly the last few years that I was on the committee back in 17 and 18, where every, every day was a brawl between one side and the other. Almost nothing was done on a bipartisan basis. So, uh, Chairman, Ranking Member, what you've done, I think, is uh, extraordinary, especially in this time of uh, uh, so much tumult in, in the Congress and, and the country at large. I, I, I have a prepared statement I can submit for the record, but in view of what you said about Ukraine, to me, this is has consequences that go beyond Ukraine, beyond Russia, and uh, as critical as that is, it's going to involve, uh, to me, our entire national security issue, uh, entire issue of terrorism, of security, national security, homeland security, it's all involved here. Uh, I mean, leaving Ukraine aside, you have Taiwan, you have the fact that our borders have been open and we know that, you think for all those years after 9-11, everyone had to go through the airports, take off their shoes, be inspected. Uh, to, to ensure that not even one terrorist made it across. Now they can come across at will. So you have that. And then you have the uh, fact that uh, uh, the war in Gaza, 
uh, where we see on the streets of New York and cities around the country thousands of Hamas sympathizers out there, which is an indication of the undercurrent that's there in the country. In many ways, to me, we are leaving even aside Ukraine. We are more vulnerable to a terrorist attack, or there are more warning signals today than there were on September 10th, 2001. And now with Ukraine, I, first of all, it's, to me, it's the moral thing to do. It's uh, the uh, a practical thing to do to stand with Ukraine, to resist Russian aggression. This isn't just one country going toward another. This is upsetting the world order. And this is sending a signal to Europe, sending a signal to Asia, but especially to Europe, to countries like Germany, France, others, that they are now going to be brought more into the uh, Russia's web of influence, economic influence, military influence. If we're not going to defend Ukraine, which does not involve the loss of one life, which as uh, you know, the ranking member said it's a rounding error, with most of that money being spent right here in the United States. If we're not going to do that, what are we going to do if they go to Lithuania or to uh, uh, Estonia? What are we going to do if they just want to take a small part of Poland, a small part of you know, the Czech Republic? You can, we can go through all of this. The scenario is there. And what signal does that send to countries like Japan and the Philippines when they see China uh, moving aggressively against Taiwan? So the consequences here, to me, all, all the light should be beaming red bright red, unfortunately, for the potential of a threat. Not just the national, uh, I don't expect Russia to attack the United States or China to attack the United States openly, but if they can, if they can move step by step, isolate us economically, if they can assert their power in the Pacific, uh, as China would do, and also what signal does this send to uh, terrorist groups? I mean, how, how many, if we're not keeping our eyes on what's happening, we saw what happened in Russia. I mean, we have so many venues here in the United States that are open to attacks such as that. And again, after 9-11, how tough it was to track all of that. Now, when you have this going on and you have the fact that we are sending a signal that we are not willing to stand by a country who is, risk, who is putting lives at risk, putting their whole country at risk, and spend fortune going bankrupt to defend themselves, which is really is defending us. I mean, we should... The thought that we, if anyone had told, and I'm saying this as a Republican, told Ronald Reagan that countries are willing to die, uh, put their lives in the line to stop Russia, and we would do nothing, they wouldn't believe it. So I would say, to, and I have great respect for the speaker, but if this is true, we cannot allow two or three people and a fringe of a party to set national foreign policy. You just can't do that. And I would say the same thing if I was on the other side of that issue. To me, it's wrong to be bringing down speakers to the House. It's wrong to be changing a foreign policy of a nation to satisfy two or three people who want to go off in a frolic of their own. So to me, this could be a disastrous day for America, a disastrous day for the Congress. And again, having been here and seen what can be done when people do put their minds to it, as Jane was saying, after 9-11, how the country came together. Congress came together. Believe it or not, we all, we all worked together. Having lived through 9-11, I know how important that was. But I can see this happening again. So I would just urge you to keep doing what you're doing and hope that some of the intelligence in both senses that comes out of this committee will spread itself to the rest of the Congress, and we will put aside those who want to make names for themselves, who want to put up videos themselves, who want to somehow make spectacles themselves, and allow that to determine foreign policy. To me, it's outrageous. I mean, Andre Koss and I agree on very few issues. We work together in the Homeland Security. It can be done. It really can. And so, anyway, uh, all I can say is that uh, let's try to work together. I hope the rest of the Congress can do what you're doing, and I hope today does not become the dark day for America that it pretends to be. So, I yield back. Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Himes, and really all the members of the committee, because it takes leadership and followership to succeed. You have rescued this committee from what could have been oblivion, and the fruit of your labor is passage of 702 FISA. Thank God. The fruit of your labor needs to be saving Ukraine. This is the first day I've been back since I was gerrymandered out of office. Uh, it's sad to me that it's potentially such a tragic day for America. I hope that April 17th, 2024 does not go down in history as the day that America made perhaps the gravest betrayal in its history by having committed to a staunch friend and ally like Ukraine, and then having stopped aiding our ally right in the middle of a war. 
who could do that to people who are fighting so fiercely and valiantly, not only on their own behalf, but on the free world's behalf? Franklin Roosevelt talked about a day that would live in infamy. Well, that's when we were blindly attacked at Pearl Harbor. But this could be worse because we could be inviting attack, as my colleagues have mentioned, not only of other parts of Ukraine, but of NATO allies. That is stunning, and it not only betrays America's heritage, it betrays great leaders like President Ronald Reagan, who simply would not recognize what is happening today. And for the few advocates on the crazy other side, whatever it is, to be repeating Putin memes and disinformation and lies and calling that somehow American policy is wrong. But it's even worse for leaders to yield to that. I'd like to submit my testimony for the record, but thank you to Hipsy for having rescued bipartisanship. It's not hard, easy to do. It's hard. Once you're in the ditch, it's hard to pull out. And to me, the fundamental here is actually pretty simple because the vast majority of Americans, the vast majority of members of Congress are pretty sensible, fair people. You're good people caught in a bad system. And there are ways to fix the system. In a week, the University of Pennsylvania is going to convene a dozen or so former members to try to offer some guidance because it used to be better. It can be better again. The first rule is please don't quit. If you do, you will be replaced by someone way worse. <laughs> Uh, I wish that were different, but that seems to be the rule these days. And see, even the best newcomer, it takes them a long time to learn the ropes. It's complicated. It's hard. And what this committee does, to have people show up who care deeply about the subject matter, even though they can't talk about it, and who are committed to strengthening America instead of playing in the ruins, you are saving our country. So this committee is a great model for the rest of Congress. Congress used to be better. I came when Tip O'Neill was speaker. He would fight President Reagan during the day and drink beer with him at night. His best friend was a Republican leader, Bob Michael. <laughs> he decried the Tuesday, Thursday club of members who just flew in and out. And really, Wednesday was the only day you could do anything. And they were not serious legislators in Tip's book. And he was right. And when I was here, we all belonged to the Tuesday, Thursday club because Everybody left. It can and must be different if we are going to continue to lead the world. But American power is declining. Other nations are rising. But the main fault is what we've done to ourselves. We are slipping. And we've got to stop that slip. The fundamental problem is minority rule. We let, through various rules, and my testimony goes into the details, a tiny group of people run the House of Representatives. And that is wrong. The majority needs to run things. We need to protect minority rights always, but the majority should speak for the House of Representatives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you all for being here, and also thank you for your help and support in the reauthorization of 702. Uh, your messages, your voices mattered, um, and your experiences mattered. Uh, we, I think in the end, it was clear we passed uh, 702 with over 270 votes. I think people understood that this was about um, our intelligence community uh, spying on foreigners abroad. And uh, those that uh, wanted to cast it as a, a bulk spying uh, program, which it was not, or a program that is dir uh, directed at Americans, it is not. I think in the end, the message was clear and, and that it goes to the heart of our intelligence gathering, which helped keeps us safe. So thank you for your support in that. My first question to you is one that I could not imagine that I would be in a position to have to ask, but I'm going to start with, is Russia our adversary? And I'm going to start with, with you, uh, Ms. Harmer Jane. Um, if you would please, um, I'm going to go and ask each of you, uh, is Russia our adversary? And then I'm going to ask a few questions ab about that. Well, the, the short answer is yes, 
but it could be nuanced. Is Russia our adversary everywhere? Uh, I happen to be on the advisory committee to NASA, and the International Space Station's flying around, at least until 2028, and the Russians and the Americans work together, together on experiments in space, and so far as I know, because I keep asking about this, the relations are totally friendly. The Russians and the Americans and others used to work together while I was head of the Wilson Center in the Arctic. Not so much anymore. The Russians and the Americans and the Chinese uh, and the Europeans were all signatory, uh, we could go into this at length, I'm sure we don't want to, uh, up to the JCPOA, which had to do with uh, curtailing the worst part of Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions. Um, we worked together. That wasn't so long ago. Uh, but now, uh, the, the old liberal world order, the so-called liberal is with a small L, it doesn't mean anything that is partisan, uh, the liberal world order uh, designed by many countries with U.S. leadership after World War II is in tatters, and there is not yet another framework. So at the moment, my answer to you is no. Uh, Russia and the U.S. are working against each other, not just uh, in, in terms of Ukraine and its brazen illegal um, uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, but Russia is lurking uh, in the Middle East and in the Indo-Pacific and Russia's alliance with China, uh, which we had hoped would never happen, uh, makes this more lethal, and then you add the additional um, uh, team players on that side of North Korea and Iran, and it is, a, as Madeleine Albright used to say, a total mess. Mr. King? I would say in almost every respect, Russia is our adversary and an enemy. Eliana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Russia is our adversary. It is our, our enemy. I was born in Cuba, had to leave my native homeland when I was eight years old with my family, fe fleeing uh, communist aggression. And uh, who had taken over in, in Cuba? Russia. It was all over. They, Russian soldiers, uh, Russian hardware. Uh, so in my mind, They've always been our enemy. Sometimes we wanted to look the other way and, and pretend that they, they could be our allies. But uh, we're waking up to the reality way too late, something the Cuban-American community has known for an awfully long time, a painfully long time. Um, so it can happen, and it can happen in Ukraine. It can happen throughout, throughout the rest of Europe. This is really sad and tragic. Mr. Cooper? Jane Harman has defined correctly, I think, the arena in which Russia is not only our adversary, but the adversary of the free world. It's sad that a declining, desperate power like Russia would be ruled by um, nationalists like Putin, who's desperate to cling to power regardless of the massacre of his own soldiers on the battlefield of Ukraine, and the mistreatment of so many of his own people, including his bravest like Navalny and others, who all they want is a little taste of freedom. These are deeply pro-Russian people who just want a little bit of freedom because they caught a glimpse of it a few decades ago that Putin has now uh, ruined. So um, I'm thankful that this committee is here to not only guard the interests of the United States, but really of the free world, because they all depend on us every day in every way. And it's your quiet vigilance that holds NATO together, the most successful military alliance in the history of the world, as Putin, bit by bit, has been the only aggressor since World War II to take European territory as his own. <clears throat> uh, Jane, you... Um you acknowledge that although there were times we cooperated that um, that Russia self-selects by Putin uh, to to be our adversary and adversary to the West you you have just returned uh, from Ukraine so you have the most fresh of perspective of, of everyone testifying to today um, the the first argument that people have is that in not supporting Ukraine is Russia is not our adversary the second is is that Ukraine has time um, if, if, um, if we fail to act soon, does Ukraine have time? Is this critical? Are we, are, do we, are we at a crisis? We are at a crisis. 
we have to act now. Uh, we should have acted two months ago when the Senate passed its bill. Uh, this is an existential crisis for the West, not just for Ukrainians who are dying on the battlefield as we dither here. Uh, and we is the House of Representatives dithering, not to make any of you feel bad. Um, you're all members of it. God save you. But you, uh, I know, I I'm assuming all of you want a better result than you're getting from, from the House at the moment uh, on a bipartisan basis. But at any rate, um, yeah, every moment we lose, we lo they lose people and we lose freedom. I agree with what Jim just said. Uh, one of my other hats these days is co-chair of Freedom House which is the storied human rights organization in the United States, which uh, uh, has tried uh, to protect uh, imprisoned journalists like Kara Musa in Russia and mourns the death of Navalny, knows his widow, and all the things that Jim said, and, and we all agree with this, are right, that it, it is Vladimir Putin. I mean, maybe the, the better way to say it is Vladimir Putin's uh, uh, rule in Russia is uh, you know, uh, our enemy. I mean, is there a potential someday ever of restoring a relationship with a great power? Yes, uh, it's a declining power, but it still has, uh, you know, some huge, huge uh, territory for sure, 11 time zones. But at any rate, my bottom line, yes, I want you to hear me, is Russia now is our enemy. Russia now is threatening the West. Russia now is threatening the freedom of the world. Thank you. We had a classified briefing yesterday from the intelligence community concerning the uh, crisis and the critical <coughs> nature of the need for the approval of aid. And uh, my ranking member Jim Himes and I asked them to take their uh, written statements <coughs> and uh, to work to declassify them, which they're going to be providing us that we're going to provide today, uh, which sets out the fact that uh, this really is a, a critical uh, time uh, point right now. Uh, with that, I recognize Mr. Himes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you for those um, compelling statements uh, on the importance of getting Ukraine aid passed today. I think that that message is really critical to deliver. Uh, Mr. Cooper, I want to spend some time. Uh, first of all, I was reading your testimony, which you submitted for the record, and it's fascinating to me that much of your testimony is, uh, consists of recommendations for how to make the Congress work better. It's not about satellites or collection. It's about how us being more functional. I've got a question for you as the, one of the founders of um, Space Force on our overhead architecture, but, but take a minute here and, and just, it, it, is, it is fascinating to see that you used your testimony to really talk about our functionality. So elaborate on that for a minute or so. Well, the great uh, current author, Michael Lewis, wrote a book called The Fifth Risk, which said that of all the risks that America faces, and number one is a nuclear war, things like that that you're familiar with, the fifth highest risk is congressional and governmental dysfunction. And uh, the House of Representatives, unfortunately, is living that nightmare today. So a lot of House workings are opaque to the outside world. Uh, sometimes members don't know the rules, uh, but the rules matter. And the bottom line of my testimony is the House can free itself to be great. You can unshackle yourselves if you can just find the key to your chains. And oftentimes that's just letting the majority work its will. One of the points I make is that the Speaker is supposed to be the Speaker of the whole House, not just the majority leader. That's someone else's job to try to get one party an advantage or another. The speaker is third in line to the presidency, should be in charge of keeping America great. And unfortunately, that's a hard job, but a necessary one. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. I, 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 I really cherish the sentiments. I, I get asked, as I know all the members of this committee do frequently about what we worry most about. And like so many of our predecessors, including a lot of our uh, founders, um, I, I really worry more that it will be us that does us in, uh, as opposed to a, uh, a foreign threat. And uh, I share your concern that we're that we're too far that we're already far down that line. Okay, um, 
to the to the more germane subject of the committee, uh, and Mr. Cooper, just because of uh, all that you did for Space Force and all the thinking you did about our overhead architecture, let, let's get down to the nitty gritty of some things that would be helpful here. I have been haunted by a persistent fear um, that the way we think about our overhead architecture in the intelligence community may be the version of mounted cavalry going into surviving ridiculously into the 20th century. It's the ultimate asymmetric thing. Some of these birds are billion dollar birds. They can be down by a $40,000 laser. I mean, I don't need to tell you the whole story. But um, give us, take a couple of minutes, uh, Mr. Cooper, if you would. Um, there's a lot of approaches to that problem. Um, the IC generally uh, does something that I fear may be sort of putting armor on that horse. Uh, you know, we can, we can, you know, do this or that. We can, you know, protect uh, whatever it is. Um, but um, I wonder whether we're not sort of thinking, uh, whether we're thinking too little um, about different form factors about. So anyway, uh, let me stop. Uh, ambling on here, um, give us two or three minutes, and I'll open it up if I have time to the others. But what, how should we be thinking strategically about the future of our overhead architecture and collection? Well, thanks for bringing up my favorite subject, and I won't bore you because I'm doing a book on this, and it's. Um, but the simple version is this, um, and a former secretary of the Air Force said it: um, the United States Air Force built a glass house in space. Uh, and she went on to say, before the invention of stones. We made all of our satellites completely defenseless, even our military satellites. And right after Glasnost and Perestroika, perhaps that was okay, but Putin's been on the march since his invasion of Georgia decades ago. So we need a resilient architecture. The easiest way to do that is low Earth orbit. Uh, there are many ways, affordable ways, easy ways to do that. Uh, generals such as John Hyten have championed that for years, but he, as Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was unable to get that done. We need to continue that effort because the best defense is a resilient architecture. There are many other things we could talk about, but that can be done. And thinking about it the correct way is so important. You have to get the right metaphor. Many people do think of our satellites today as if they were cavalry instruments. <laughs> they are not. You cannot armor a horse and make it a tank. Uh, we need the weapons of today and tomorrow, not of the past. Could I, I, I add? Yeah, yeah, by all means. I want to be courteous to my uh, colleagues, but if, uh, the other, if the other witnesses have thoughts on the topic of overhead architecture and thinking strategically, I'd welcome them. I, I, in, very briefly, uh, not only to support that, but I represented a district in Southern California, which I call the Satellite Center of the Universe. And there were these one-offs that cost an absolute fortune that, as Jim says, are totally vulnerable. And we have so many better options now. Uh, the private sector is way ahead of government in this field, especially in low Earth orbit. And you, all you have to think about is, is SpaceX and what they're doing, but there are other competitors too. And the right answer is to leverage private sector technology and to produce things in much greater quantities at much lower cost and build in uh, protection. We are more... Uh, uh, our whole defense uh, structure is dependent on space, and we are more vulnerable in space than any other country. Peter? Yeah. I'll just make one sentence, really. I think every civilization has made the mistake of relying on imaginal line. And you have to realize when the time has come to, to protect yourself and live in the new world. It can't be horses against tanks. It can't be the imaginal line against the blitzkrieg. OK. Quick, uh, 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 Mr. quick Mr. note, fun yeah. for members. Um, there's a wonderful movie featuring Julia Roberts called The World We Left Behind that really explains this beautifully and it's fun. And there's a wonderful novel, 2034, by Admiral James DeVritis and Elliot Ackerman that really get into how World War III starts and it starts this way. Thank you, thank you. I think given the choice between the Congressional Research Service and a movie with uh, Julia Roberts, that Congress will probably choose the latter option. Thank you, I yield back. Sorry, I got to quit laughing. Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually watched that movie just the other day, and it's uh, pretty scary, scary stuff. Um, I'm glad you guys have kind of really um, expounded on Ukraine. I want to, and that's, a, that's a sort of an imminent threat that we're dealing with right now. One of the things that I think we have sort of glossed over over the last 20 years throughout the, that posture when we were engaging in the, the war on, global war on terrorism 
and that was sort of the marshalling of forces, if you will, to address that threat at our expense here in our own hemisphere. And that has opened the door to, to a pervasive China threat. Everywhere we go in our hemisphere, we see an aggressive China. And I wonder if, and, and I'll start with you, Ileana, because I know that you're well versed in this, and, and um, I wonder if you could sort of address that threat. Um, why is it so difficult from a national security perspective for us to walk and chew gum at the same time? We tend to focus on that, that, that primary threat, which was the global war on terror. Now we've seen that shift to the great power adversaries as it applies to uh, Ukraine and Taiwan, but we're leaving our own hemisphere somewhat unprotected, and, and I want to get your insights on that. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you again, sir. Me too. Uh, China and Russia have no holds barred open territory in all of our uh, Western uh, Hemisphere uh, countries, which includes the, the Caribbean. Russia is heavily invested in, in Nicaragua, where they have uh, moved a lot of their military hardware. Uh, and they have free reign, whatever they wish to do, in terms of intelligence uh, um, operations uh, that they're planning uh, against the U.S. in terms of uh, technology, what they can pick up uh, from the U.S. Uh, Venezuela and Cuba, of course, have always had their, uh, not always, but they've, they've been open uh, for uh, further investment from China and Russia. They're cash-starved countries. Uh, their people are malnourished. They need the money not to feed the people, but in order to keep themselves in power. And, uh, and, and it's, it's fertile ground. And Cuba, I forgot to mention when we were talking about, about Russia, Cuba actually has forces uh, fighting uh, Ukrainians uh, there on the, on the battlefield. So uh, in terms of intelligence, these countries are know that they can come in and they can take over uh, all of the uh, military operations and intelligence gathering. And it, it's so close to our borders, it's right there. And that's what makes the porous border uh, very, very difficult for, for me to comprehend why we're allowing this to happen. And you see individuals coming who, that, who pose a, a clear and present danger to the United States openly coming into this country. But China and Russia have an open field in Latin America and, uh, and it's happening right beneath our, our noses, and we're doing nothing about it. Yeah. And we can't even help Ukraine. We can't even tell our NATO allies we're with them. We expect other people to, to come into the fray when we're not stepping in. It, it's, it's just incredible. But Ms. thank Harmon. you. Thank you. Ms. Harmon, did you want to comment on that? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I actually do. I agree with Ileana about Russia's influence. I'd also add China's influence uh, in the global south. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative is everywhere. Uh, you go to Caribbean countries, you go to Latin American countries, airports are built by the Chinese, uh, supermarkets are run by the Chinese. Uh, in my capacity as chair of this uh, Commission on National Defense Strategy, we had an interview with the head of Southern Command who said, among other things, that there are at least five countries in Latin America without confirmed ambassadors. That's a little off, off the field from the Pentagon. But if we don't have ambassadors there, we're sending a message that we don't care. Mm -hmm. And uh, same story could be told about Africa. But I think it is uh, at, at, at great risk to the United States that we are not paying more attention. And I think it's the right question. Last comment. Uh, I was here. I think we were all here in the George W. Bush administration when uh, comprehensive immigration reform was on the House floor. Mm -hmm. I, I voted for it. It wasn't a perfect bill, but I surely voted for it. It failed by just a few votes. And uh, what a shame. And I would also note that, so far as I know, the border protections in the Senate passed uh, appropriations bill, assuming they're still in it, uh, seem to me to be pretty strong and a good start. Thank you. Just real quick, our, our whole of government approach to counter China is insufficient because China's whole of government is their entire economy. Agree or disagree? You are so correct. We can't even conceive of the coordination of their effort or of the ability for them to make long-term plans, sometimes multi-generational plans. So, And it's not the Chinese people 
who are our potential adversaries here. It's the current leadership that's so desperate because they mismanaged their economy, they mismanaged COVID, they're clinging to power just like Putin, and they will do anything using these long-range coordinated plans to undermine uh, the American way of life and the free world's way of life. So whether it's Belt and Road or some of these other initiatives, um, we've got to um, up our game so that we can meet and beat that threat. And they're looking at, uh, at what we're doing on, on Taiwan. We're not offering, we're not passing a, an aid package and uh, China's influence there, they're not gonna stop at, uh, at Taiwan. They're, all the, the Marshall Islands, Palau, all of those uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, countries are, are in great peril with China breathing down their neck. Peter? Yeah, Rick, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, is any number of reasons why a free society can't focus on, it's hard to focus on more than one threat at a time, but you're right. We had 9-11, uh, we had terrorism, and then during that entire time, China was moving. I think we have to realize the fact that in our country today, how many American businesses, and as you're saying, you know, the government and the uh, 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 military, the political machine in China, all won. And yet we have so many American companies heavily invested in China. In many ways, they have the hammer over us. If another pandemic would come, they could cut us off. Uh, how many businesses do we deal with, key vital businesses, who are involved with China? And somehow that's considered okay. I mean, if we look back on it now, and we saw American companies doing business with Nazi Germany in 1938 and 1939, we could say, what was wrong with them? Well, I say today, what is wrong with the American society today that so much business continues to be done, business as usual. We don't look upon China as the enemy, and it is. There's more of an enemy than Russia. But Russia is now an immediate threat with the Ukraine, but overall, whether it's South America, whether it's Africa, whether it's Europe, whether it's Asia, China is the main adversary and enemy that we have. They're trying to undercut us every way, and yet we do more and more business with them every year. There's no restrictions on it at all. But we can go through TikTok, which is almost minor compared to others. So I just think that we have to somehow alert the American people. It can't be business as usual. And we have to realize that China is a real, real existential threat to the United States. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman. It's so good to see each and every one of you. Uh, miss you dearly. Uh, I think to Peter's point, uh, even though he and I have uh, methodological differences in terms of our strategy and our, even our rhetoric, I think our end goals are the same, and that's to make sure we have a secure homeland and we're keeping Americans safe. I do have a question. Um, we know that intelligence oversight can be very complicated, um, and the legal process is, 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 is quite difficult at times for us to navigate through. Um, as we debate FISA 702 reauthorization, uh, what advice do you have for this committee and our colleagues? Balancing between national security and addressing very real civil liberty concerns. I would suggest that the debate remain intelligent, the way I believe it was done in this committee. Yes, there's abuses. There's always abuses, whether it's law enforcement or whatever it is, you're always going to find abuses. The idea is to control those abuses, eliminate them to the extent possible, but not lose sight of the overall factor that we have enemies out there trying to destroy us. So I have no problem at all with somebody pointing out an abuse, somebody saying this has to be changed. What bothers me is somehow people think this is one vast national conspiracy to destroy the rights of all Americans. That's the kind of debate that belongs on maybe Saturday Night Live, but does not belong in the halls of Congress. We have to have something more intelligent than that, and we can't let those people be driving the debate. But no, I think, listen, uh, I, I've seen abuses. I mean, we can get into a whole partisan issue. I've seen abuses by the intelligence community at certain times, not to bring all that back. It was there. But I never wanted to bring down the entire intelligence community or say defund, you know, defund the FBI, defund the CIA, stop Pfizer. To me, that is suicidal. And to me, democracy is not a suicide pact. And I think that it just is a reflection of the, the decline in American society in respect for institutions, whether those institutions are the ones that deal with the rule of law or anything. It's uh, whether it's the FBI, federal agencies, Congress, um, the disrespect for what we used to take for granted, the institutions that make this uh, the most wonderful country on earth. The, who, People are dying to come to the United States. They're not dying to get into China. They're not dying to get into Russia. They all want to come here because of our freedoms. But uh, our institutions must be respected. But it's the decline in that respect and the disbelief that those institutions stand for them that, uh, that hurts me. If, if I could add a little history to this, um, 
uh, after uh, 9-11, the U.S. uh, commenced a program called Stellar Wind, uh, which I knew a lot about as ranking member. I was in the Gang of Eight, heard all about it, asked if it fully complied with law, answered yes. It turned out that it fully complied with an opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel, but it didn't comply with FISA. And so there was a huge effort here, and I think we were all here, in 2008 to fashion Section 702 and other amendments to FISA. And to get it passed, we agreed that it would sunset every five years, which was probably a prudent idea. That's what's going on again. Uh, And was it perfect? Of course not. But has technology advanced? Yes. And these amendments to 702 that we're talking about now are just to make sure the technology keeps up Uh, with the targets, not to expand the target set. And that is not well understood, but this committee I know understands it. I would just close with this. Uh, Security and liberty are not a zero-sum game. We need more of both. And again, I think the the enlightened conversation around 702 is to acknowledge that there have been some mistakes, but that the purpose of the law as, as, as carefully construed is valid. If we want to pre- prevent uh, attacks against our country, we have to have the tools. And so I just want to commend all of you on a bipartisan basis for understanding what it is and what it isn't and for trying to educate the public. On a personal note, Andre, if I could just say that uh, as far as us working together, I remember when you were first named to this committee, there was some opposition to that, and I was proud to speak out on your behalf. Appreciate you dearly. I have never regretted it. I won't forget it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I, I want to thank all of you. And um, as we have sat here, uh, the news is is conjecturing that um, the speaker um, may be moving forward with bringing Ukraine aid to the to the floor. And I certainly hope that that would be the case. Um, your your voices are very important, not only in the processes of getting this bill to the floor, but also <coughs> we're going to have if the Speaker does move forward as he had said he's going to with putting this bill on the floor. We're going to need to pass it in your voices, so please continue your efforts uh, to remind members of uh, of the need to uh, oppose authoritarian regimes and support democracies. Uh, are there any closing remarks from any of you? Anything you want to add that you've not gotten to to uh, to point out to us that since you've come here? I would just make one other point, and and Peter was hinting at this. You know we. We seem to surge in U.S. foreign policy, I'm not blaming this committee, from focus on one thing to the next thing. The Cold War ended and we thought, we won, everybody else lost. And in the decades of the 90s, we missed the rise of China, we missed the rise of terrorism, we missed the rise of Russian grievance. Then came 9-11 and we surged everything into the GWAT, the Global War on Terror. And uh, we got some things right, we got some things very wrong. Iraq was one of the things we got very wrong. We corrected some of our mistakes. Now our defense doctrine is surging everything against China as the pacing challenge. I'm not arguing that China is our main challenge, but it is not our only challenge, uh, obviously, as we've been discussing. So why am I mentioning this? Because the intelligence community has to have a broad lens, cannot just go into a new silo against China, has to look at everything. And I know that you are aware of that, but it's in my written testimony uh, that, you know, please, please, please make sure that the IC continues uh, to be open to everything that's going on in the world and to have responsible, not partisan leadership. And same is true of this committee. It is crucial that the oversight of this activity be done the way you are doing it. Uh, and the Senate is doing it. It's it, it, we will not have our democracy in the future if we don't have the tip of the spear that warns us of threats and if we don't have unvarnished, uh, the unvarnished ability to speak truth to power. And Mr. Chairman, uh, when Mr. Cooper pointed out the, uh, uh, the line of uh, bipartisanship, he said Tip O'Neill uh, got along with Ronald Reagan. I, I looked it up and it says uh, not only that, Ted Kennedy got along with Orrin Hatch, Joe Biden got along with John McCain. Nancy Pelosi got along with John Boehner. Ruth Bader Ginsburg got along with uh, Antonin Scalia. And it's such a, a long list. And, and I got along with Ileana. <laughs> <laughs> now it's a four-letter word in some of our caucuses. 
Thank you all so much. A great, uh, great testimony, and I appreciate your continued work. Please, uh, at, at any time, take our invitation to get in touch with us uh, to uh, to tell us the things that you think are important that we need to be focusing on. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chairman.